Greetings to our viewers and listeners. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be speaking to Judge Johann Krischler today. The topic of our conversation is the judiciary in democratic South Africa. And I couldn't think of a better person to be discussing this matter with me than Johann. Johann was called to the Johannesburg Bar in 1959 and proceeded to practice as an advocate for 25 years. Uh, after this, he spent 10 years on the bench, first in the provincial division of the Supreme Court, and then as an appellate judge. So Johan has a profound understanding of the legal profession and the judiciary, both where it has come from, and of course, in its transition into a democratic era. Throughout his career, Johan has been a leading figure in a number of human rights and public interest advocacy organizations. With the dawn of democracy, Johan went on to serve as a justice on the Constitutional Court from its founding in 1994 until 2002. Johan is now chair of the nonprofit organization Freedom Under Law, which promotes the rule of law and the independence of various pivotal constitutional institutions. Johan, thank you so very much for joining me. It's a pleasure, Cecilia. Uh, let me emphasize that I speak as Johan Krichler, not as chair or spokesperson of freedom under law, although I sincerely hope that any views or ideals I express are in conformity with the organizations. Thank you, Johan. Um, Johan, a good starting point for our discussion may be to look at the state of the judiciary at the time of democratic change. As we know, a decision was taken in negotiations not to require the wholesale resignation of the judiciary, uh, leaving some question marks hanging over the legitimacy and competence of many judges. After all, you know, we know full well that there were apartheid loyalists in the judiciary. Um, what did we inherit? We inherited a perfectly functioning partial judicial system. In respect of white South Africa, the judiciary functioned 100%. In respect of a quasi-colonial regime, the judiciary operated perfectly correctly. In res judged as a judiciary in respect of a multiracial, non-colonial society, it was a failure but it was a functioning judiciary, which in many respects distinguishes the South African setup and the transitional challenges from a number of other emergent democracies. It was an advantage and it was a disadvantage. I believe that the debate within the ANC beforehand wisely came to the conclusion that they should opt for let's keep what we've got and change it as quickly as we can and reform it both in terms of its mindset and in terms of its composition as, as soon as is consistent with functionality. I think that was a wise decision in the wisdom of hindsight. I have no doubt it was the correct decision. You touched upon the composition of the judiciary. What was it at the time? Well, first of all, the judiciary functions at two levels. It has for, for more than a century or more, nearly two centuries, a magistracy, uh, the lower courts, and then the higher courts with the, used to be the Supreme Court, now the High Court, uh, operating on a provincial level, judges in the latter, magistrates in, in the lower courts. The magistracy in particular was an arm of the executive, uh, consistent with its colonial back, background, its history, where the magistrate was locally the executive representative and the chief judicial officer, the district commissioner of, of the classic British colonial system. The magistracy was by 19... Uh, 90, 
virtually exclusively Afrikaans speaking uh, for the vast majority, white male. There were women, there were some blacks, particularly in the so-called homelands. There was, of course, a whole system of, of magistracies with black magistrates uh, at two levels, district level and regional level of magistrates. Uh, these were post-colonial. I think in 1993, the statute was introduced, which separated the magistracy from the executive and made magistrates purely judicial officers. The a high court, the Supreme Court, as it was in those days, and its political court, the appellate division, consisted largely, uh, exclusively, of professional lawyers drawn from the banks, the ranks of the advocates profession, uh, a few, a handful from the attorney's profession, I think one or two possibly from academia, but they were also very largely white male. I think there was one white female judge. I think Ishmael Muhammad by 1994 was already on the bench in the old regime. And, and the homelands, of course, the so-called uh, independent homelands. And in some of the uh, self-governing territories, there were black judicial officers at the high court level. But in what was uh, described as white South Africa, virtually exclusively white male, largely Afrikaans, I would say also largely uh, supporters of the regime, although there were a significant number of, of judges, such as Richard Goldstone, uh, John Milne, uh, and so forth, who were apolitical or certainly opposed to the current, then current regime. I joined the judiciary in 1984 on the express basis that I was going there as an opponent of the regime, uh, uh, and I would be expressing my views in, the, in that way. I had the, the express agreement of the then Minister of Justice to go on that basis. So the, it wasn't exclusively uh, government supporting. And I may also say to look, describe it merely as apartheid is also an oversimplification because from round about uh, 1985, 86, increasingly the Bota regime was trying to, to, to do little reforms here and little reforms there, faith in grand apartheid having all but disappeared entirely, even within the ranks of the cabinet that was then running the country. Uh, I would think that the majority of judges were certainly voted, would vote for the government uh, and it would be somewhere of the order of 60-40. But we didn't talk politics, so that's just a guess, a thumb suck. The judiciary was competent. It was certainly uh, well organized. It was well disciplined. Uh, I think we, we ran a tight ship. Uh, technically. I also think that in terms of the, the law, uh, there was a, a high level of expertise in various branches, esoteric branches, difficult branches, uh, property, intellectual property law, uh, uh, company law, insurance law, maritime law, uh, specialized areas. The, the judiciary was well able to deal with the demands of a modern economy in respect of adjudication of those issues. You've highlighted some of the strengths of the judiciary as it stood at the dawn of democracy. Um, would one of the weaknesses be a mindset issue? Or can you tell us a bit more about the weaknesses at that point? Oh, certainly. Uh, uh, the mind, it, it goes without saying, I've been describing a person with an amputated leg manages very well with what is left. The mindset was executive minded. The 
ju the jurisprudence of the day uh, based on English administrative law was extremely executive minded and the was there was no power within the judiciary to measure the reasonableness of any legislative or executive action. The power of review, of judicial review, was technically extremely limited. The, uh, the law was such, there was no constitution empowering judges to, to measure the, the, the uh, reasonableness of executive or legislative conduct. So the mindset was, we are interpreters of the law, we are appliers of the law as it stands. We are not there to judge or criticize either the executive made law or the legislatively made law. It was a, 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 a tunnel vision, a clear vision, but a tunnel vision. The constitution established an entirely different mindset. It is, the constitution introduced a value system which was never there before. There was never an evaluative power in, in the judiciary. And it was uh, an aufklärung, a, a, a dawning, a, a, a daybreak for, for, for many of us. And for many of the existing judges, it was a blinding light. It was difficult to work in an entirely new set of circumstances where you had this duty and this power to, to, to measure qualitatively, ethnic, ethically, uh, uh, and in terms of a constitution that set certain inalienable norms. Uh, so it, it was a, a much greater switch than is appreciated by most people who were not directly involved in the changeover. I think this was the perfect moment uh, in which to navigate into the democratic era. Uh, let's look at how the judiciary has broadly functioned over the past two and a half decades. Uh, we're going to get into the specifics later on, but right now I'd really like to focus on the whole in broad strokes. Has the judiciary fulfilled its role? Has it applied and developed the law competently and independently without fear, favor, or prejudice? And has it, has it given, you know, as you've already spoken about, has it given life to our constitution? Uh, so just in, in really very broad terms, how would you assess the, the judiciary? So, I, I, I'm glad I'm given an opportunity to talk on the topic. Let me just give a, 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 a brief contextual background. The, over the last two and a half decades, we have had an increasingly rogue executive. It did not start under Zuma. It started before Zuma. Recall the battle with the scorpions of the day. That wasn't a Zuma created. And the problem with the scorpions was that they were doing their job too well. It wasn't that they were corrupt or that they were exceeding their powers. They were just too efficient. The executive became increasingly rogue and under uh, the Zuma regime, as it was a, apparent from the evidence before the Zondo Commission, more latterly the last week or so, particularly, it was a criminal enterprise. It was a parallel state that was being run uh, contrary to the constitution. And the legislature at the same time was at best, at best supine. The legislature did not perform its constitutional duty of oversight over the executive. I, I repeat, it was at best supine. At times it actually colluded. It, it was the executive that asked, but it was the legislature that killed the scorpions. The parliament with its eyes open destroyed the one effective anti-corruption unit that there was. The legislature in many respects thereafter failed. In that context, in that context, 
the judiciary played a, a so honorable role for many years. It did not do so perfectly. It stumbled at times too, but it was the one pillar of our new democratic state that really tried to do what the constitution demanded of it. Uh, there are a, a number of highlights, but uh, let's not go to those. Let's just say that in principle, the judiciary did furlongs better in the race in the last two and a half decades. It was in some respects, in fact, in all respects, the maintenance of the democracy that we have today. The Zondo Commission could not have been appointed were it not for the intervention of the judiciary that eventually forced parliament, forced the ruling party, forced the executive to say enough already, call it a day. It was the judiciary's performance of constitutional duty that made that possible. And I have no doubt that the history books will one day look back on this era and say, were it not for the judiciary, South Africa would have gone down the route of so many other post-colonial democracies and descended into, at best, chaos and at worst, a military dictatorship. Johan, earlier we spoke about the composition of the judiciary as it was at the dawn of democracy. It seems quite self-evident that the judiciary couldn't continue to be drawn for the way it had been uh, from the very narrow reaches of the senior bar primarily. The judiciary clearly had to be drawn in a more inclusive way from the legal profession as a whole. On the appointment of judicial officers, uh, amongst other things, the constitution says, and, and I quote here, the need for the judiciary to reflect broadly the racial and gender composition of South Africa must be considered when judicial officers are appointed. The judiciary is now clearly different in terms of its racial and gender composition and where it is drawn from. Do you think it's now in line with the constitution? I think it's getting there. I don't think it will ever be there. I think one must always work to, uh, uh, to maintain, attain, attain and then ma maintain compliance with constitutional norms. The, in, purely in terms of ethnicity, in color, uh, skin color, it, it is infinitely more consistent with the requirements of section 174 two that you've quoted. Uh, it, it's, it, I haven't got a, a list of the judiciary before me. I'm not in fact at my home where I have my office, uh, so I couldn't check on this, but I, am, I, I can say without any shadow of a doubt and without fear of any contradiction that there's been a radical transformation of the composition of the judiciary, both in terms of color and in terms of sex. Women are much, much better represented than they used to be. In fact, in the old regime, there was virtually no participation by judges, uh, uh, by females in the judiciary, magistracy and high court. Uh, there is now significant representation I, I wouldn't like to say uh, it's close to 50 percent. I'm not sure. It has not come at without a cost. The fact is that you had to try to balance section 174.1 and section 174.2 of the constitution. One, maintenance of level of competence. Two, greater representativity, eventually, uh, hopefully, complete uh, mirror image. The two had to be balanced. I differed with uh, some of my colleagues on the balance. Arthur Chaskelson and I debated this on a number of occasions. Uh, 
Perhaps he was right, perhaps I was right. The ultimate, however, is that there was a policy of appointing people on promise, not on record. Fully justifiable politically in the circumstances. Fully, if not justifiable, demanded politically in the circumstances. Administratively, technically risky. And we've, we've, we've paid a price for it. Uh, I'm, I'm not letting any secrets out of the bag. The level of ju uh, judgments at the moment is not as good as it should be. The appointments by the Judicial Service Commission and the, by the Magistrates Commission uh, have faltered in a number of respects. In many other respects, the dis decisions, their forecasts, proved shiningly correct, but there have also been some failures. And of course, I must make this point. The, 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 the material, the stuff of adjudication, of the judge's work is experience. It's not the law. It's knowing people, knowing the ropes, knowing the world, having had your own failures, having had your own successes, have, knowing the four corners of a courtroom, knowing exactly what it is like to have an irate judge on the bench or to have a, 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 a slippery witness in the witness box. It's, it's that stuff that you need for a judge, not on the Constitutional Court, not on the Supreme Court of Appeal. There you need uh, uh, other qualities. But in the day-to-day -day functioning of a, of a trial-level judicial officer, you need experience. You need a considerable knowledge of the functioning rules of the law, and you need experience of the world. That we did not have when we went outside the ranks of the bar. That, and that has come as a price. Uh, we have seen some really strange judgments. We have seen, uh, we have not seen some very strange judgments. It's, it's inevitable if you put people on the bench that are not up to the job in terms of experience, they'll make mistakes. They learn on the bench instead of learning as an advocate at the cost of their client, they learn on the bench at the cost of the litigants. Uh, it, it, it's that simple. There have been some notable failures for that very reason. Judge John Schlope, for instance, if he had been given some years at the bar, if he had then been given some years as a junior judge on the Western Cape Court, uh, if he had been given 10, 12 years to get to know the ropes in practice and on the bench thereafter, he would have been an outstanding judge, possibly. I, I do believe that there are possibly major ethical failings, but he could well have been a, a, a towering success. He hasn't been. He was given power too soon. He was given authority too soon. And in the result, the Western Cape High Court is a very, very sad place today. Uh, a very sad place for anybody who loves the law and is serious about the administration of justice. We've talked a little bit about transformation, but I'd like to come back to that concept. Uh, everyone talks about it, but what exactly is the constitutional conception of transformation? I'm glad you asked me that question. I have a, the foggiest notion what the, the term means, and I have not been able to understand what it means. I do know it doesn't mean what most practitioners of the word think it means, replacing a white elite with a black elite. It does not mean that. It probably means changing the mindset, the field of competence and experience, its cultural appreciation and sensitivity. I cannot, as a seasoned, experienced judge, cannot work out what the probabilities are in a social relationship of which I know absolutely nothing. 
I cannot work out what the probabilities are in a familial situation in a, a, a rural African community. I would need a black colleague to, 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 with interpretation. I would need somebody with experience and knowledge in that area to supplement my defective knowledge of the world. I would, as a mere male, have learned and did learn from female colleagues who have, in some respects, an entirely different perception to, to my own. That is a cultural change. That is a transformation that the bench needed and still needs. It does need inputs of in, uh, a variety of social, political, gender, uh, generational uh, perspectives that, that uh, would go to make up a fully rounded perception of the world. If that is transformation, it's been worked at, it's being worked on. I'm not sure that we've got anywhere near where we have to be on that. And I don't think merely appointing people from particular communities, whether they be in terms of gender or sex or color or religion, uh, will meet that. I do believe that it's an ongoing dialogue within the judiciary. We talk to one another through our judgments. The law reports represent uh, a marketplace of opinions, of views, of, of uh, perspectives. The judiciary learns as it goes from finding out what its colleagues do, just as I on the constitutional court bench would learn in the course of a single case how my various colleagues have different perspectives on the same facts. Uh, that I think one could do as a change in, in general mindset. That uh, I think is transformation, but I don't think there are many, many people who necessarily agree with me. So, okay, let's take a look at what the Constitution says again, right? It says that uh, the need for the judiciary to reflect broadly the racial and gender composition of South Africa must be considered when judicial officers are appointed. You've spoken about um, the fact that uh, this criterion has often been given weight at the expense of others. How does one balance that exercise how do how do we weigh up the different factors when we consider who to appoint to the bench it's just about impossible to generalize about it i do believe and i, I once again i rely on the debates that arthur and i had many many years ago i do believe that you've got to weigh up the immeasurable the the potential of the person I have two people of, 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 of apparently equal age, uh, same sex. Uh, the one is a senior white silk and the other one is a middle-aged black attorney. Uh, the one has battled his way from the township and poverty and the other has grown up uh, in Waterkloof, Pretoria, and gone to a prime school somewhere. The one has, has, has achieved more in terms of legal uh, uh, achievement. Cases in the Constitutional Court, cases in the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, acting appointments. The other is a man who has run a private practice for years and done so successfully and has shown the capacity to grow. Which one of the two do you take? It must be a weighing up. The constitution says you must have competence and you must have representativity. It does not say transformation. It says a try to achieve representativity. That's what it says. So I, I try to do those two. And we may differ, we may differ from case to case. I do believe that if you have a case like we had with outstanding, outstanding white practitioners who would grace a bench anywhere 
in the English speaking world. You turn them down because they're white, that's impoverishing the bench. The balance has got to be maintained. Uh, there was an article in Advocate some months ago, about a year ago, or some months ago, on the, the, the perspective of the Judicial Service Commission in working on a quota system. You cannot work on a quota system. You cannot uh, ad adopt uh, as your starting point a Section 174.2 approach and say, there are not enough black judges and therefore I won't appoint anybody. If you have a genius come along and says, I'm prepared to give up a multi-million rand practice as a, as a senior silk, I'm an expert in international uh, uh, law or I'm an expert in, in, in some esoteric branch of the law, uh, intellectual property, in which there are few experts. This person is prepared to give up practice and says, I want to come and make a contribution and you appoint a nebbish from elsewhere, obviously you're mistaken. If on the other hand, you have a flash Harry who's, a, who's run a good commercial practice on a strong background, uh, uh, culturally, socially, politically, financially. And on the other hand, you have an aspiring young lawyer who, who, who's got a fire in his belly and has got the sun in his eyes, uh, the sparkle. Obviously, you, the choice is different. I will not generalize. The selection of judges is not as important as the mindset of judges, as the culture that must prevail in judicial circles. The lack of sufficient discourse in the law at the moment is upsetting. The level of discourse in the law journals is not particularly good. The level of discourse in judgments is not particularly good. Uh, we are not progressing. And I should make this point, that because of the appointment of many young, experienced Black judges, the litigants and the shrewd legal advisors opted to go for arbitration before experienced white ex-judges or senior advocates. This impoverishes the law. This impoverishes the general body of law because whatever is determined, whatever law point is determined in arbitration goes no further than that particular case. Whereas if that case had been determined in a court, there would have been public report on it, there would be comment on it in law journals, there would be other judges looking at it in other judgments, and the law grows. You grow the interaction between the constitutional demands and the common law should not be developed, cannot be developed through arbitration. It must, there must be a sufficient level of competence in the high court to attract litigants back again. You can't order them to litigate there. That, that's their right. It's, the, it's unconstitutional to compel them to submit to a, adjudication in which they have no confidence. And that's why uh, uh, Judge Unterhalter started the, uh, with the consent of, obviously, uh, with the uh, consent of his JP, his judge president, started the commercial court again in Johannesburg two years ago, three years ago, in uh, 18. Sadly, the superimposition of the COVID lockdown regime has handicapped, I think has handicapped the full development of, of that initiative. But that was a way of inviting people back into the high court, come and have your important cases determined in court, in open court, where other advocates can learn from it, where other judges can learn from it, where academics can learn from it, and where the law can grow. Uh, it, that's not happening at the moment. 
and that is a, a, a serious disadvantage. Incidentally, having mentioned COVID, no, let's get back to that later, if you like. I want to comment on it, though. so let's file it and come back to it. Perfect, we'll park COVID for now. Um, some critics say that the judiciary no longer attracts the best legal practitioners, neither black nor white, neither female nor male. Um, do you think that this is the case? And uh, if so, why? And is there something to be done about it? I cannot speak on behalf of anybody else. I have not talked to people who have declined appointment to the bench or who have not thought about it. I can tell you that I believe that it's certainly in the culture in which I grew up in the law. It was your duty once you had reached a certain level of seniority to make yourself available to go on the bench, to make the sacrifice, to give up your independence, to give up two thirds, in my case, it was four fifths of my income in order to become a judge. It was your duty. It wasn't because you were attracted to do it. It was you because you were morally obliged to do it. You make good money. You charge heavy fees as a fashionable silk in order to enable you to gather fat to go and sit the lean years on the bench. That's what it was. I don't think that applies anymore. I do not think that the high court bench has the prestige in the eyes of practitioners that it had in my day. Why that is so is largely to be laid at the doors of people like John Schlauber, but it, it is so. It's no longer seen as the acme of a successful advocate's career. Uh, I think that's the primary reason why people no longer regard it as their duty to go there. Uh, I may also say that if I were to be obliged to go to the Judicial Service Commission to have politicians try to score political points off me and humiliate me, I would think twice before I would let my name go forward. Uh, I don't blame the politicians for wanting to score political points. I blame the chair presiding at those meetings for not maintaining proper decorum and protecting honorable people who have come forward from that kind of maligning. Uh, a, a, a politician is a politician and will score points where it can. It should not be able to do so in the ranks of the Judicial Service Commission. Just like it has failed to discipline judges which it should have disciplined, it has excluded judges that it should have appointed. Both of these issues regarding the Judicial Service Commission, I'd like to uh, revisit with you a little later. I'd first like to pose the following question to you, which is the fact that, you know, the executive and parliament have been distorted by politically connected cadres, loyal cadres. Um, I, I wanted to ask whether you think the judiciary was able to escape that light. Of course not. Of course you can't, just like the judiciary under the previous regime was inevitably influenced many of its members by natural inclination, by growth, by development, by background. You're a supporter of the regime and you will go with the regime uh, by and large, uh, in, it's your fail safe position. I, I don't think that the judiciary is free of political influence. You can't expect it. It's, judges aren't cybers, they aren't computers, they're human beings. And I cannot blame a judicial officer who goes on the bench after a year, after years of, of denigration and, and insult because of the color of their skin for being resentful on the bench. I think you learn after a while that you put those things aside. 
uh, I think I learned quite a lot in the years that I got knocked on the head and in the nose. In practice, uh, it's it's human. You must you must have it knocked out of you as best you can. But that the the tradition is free of political influence, of course not. It shouldn't be, in fact. They, 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 they haven't learned it here from Mars to determine court cases, particularly public law cases with political implications. They must be alert to the implications. But above all, nowadays it's much easier than in my day, in my early days. It's much easier because you've got the template of the constitution that tells you this is right and that is wrong. You don't have to make value judgments by sucking your thumb. Yes, of course, there is always the matter of interpretation, um, which gets a bit murky, but on the whole, absolutely. Um, I would now like to return to the issue of the Judicial Service Commission. Um, while a lot has been written about the composition of the JSC, and it, as we know, has a significant amount of political and presidential appointments, you know, less is generally made of the way in which the JSC goes about its work, which is something that you touched upon earlier. What do you think about the way in which the JSC conducts its interviews? Is there a consistency uh, in questions and approach? Uh, and are there actually questions that are posed that really relate to whether someone might be a good judge? Or is, or is the JSC looking for those who hold the right political opinions? Cecilia, the, 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 you, what you ask is, is actually a number of questions and one should break it down. The composition of the Judicial Service Commission has been a matter of debate. It's how it differs from what it was under the interim constitution when there was a much lesser political influence and the, the weight was more in favor of the judges than the politicians than it is now. Uh, I've debated this in, in, in other jurisdictions that have followed the South African glowing example of a judicial service commission to take this vexed question of judicial appointments and dismissals out of the political arena. And they've, they've looked on us as having set the, the gold standard of, of this particular difficult constitutional instrument. And it has failed abysmally. It has failed abysmally, not because of its composition, not because of the predominance of political appointees. It has failed because the members have not done their duty. It's that simple, whether they are political appointments or judicial appointments to the Judicial Service Commission, they have not seen to it that this magnificent tool has, used, has been used as it should have been used to both in hiring and in firing. And then in the firing, the politicians have no say, and that's where the major failing has been. The fact that there are judges' cases that are lingering for years and years and more than a decade is not the fault of the Judicial Service Commission Act. It's not the fault of the political members on it. It is the fault of the judicial members of that commission who have not pushed with the requisite weight of their high office and the moral persuasion that they have as judges. The fact that you saw recently uh, in the case of some judges who had been tried. Cecilia, now let's be serious. These people had been held to have failed in their duty as judges because they did not deliver judgments in good time. This, this from the Judicial Service Commission that can take 12 years not to decide a case, the, the, the barefaced effrontery of it 
to, to, co to convict somebody in those circumstances. And then of course they'd let them off with a slap on the wrist because it's so much time, they're so old now. They can't be unkind to an old man. You let him get old while you dilly-dallied in, in, and shilly-shallied. Instead of grabbing the case, the mechanism under the Judicial Service Commission Act and the, the regulations is designed to protect judges against malicious conduct complaints against them. It is a protective mechanism. It protects excessively if you do not deal with it firmly. The situation manifested by the case of Judge Slope shows that it is open to manipulation. It is subject to, to, to manipulation if it is not used firmly. I believe that those who have been in charge regarded as constitutionally their duty to be patient, to be, be give time, to hear the other side and hear the other side again, and to give them another opportunity and to be fair. And to, in the case of Judge Slope, I do believe there are people who've been running interference for him. It's not just goodwill. It's not just incompetence. It, I do believe that there have been people who tried to protect him, not because he's a good judge, but because he is an iconic black judge. And that was a tragic mistake. He's been a, an example of the worst possible kind. I would like to return to the matter of discipline and in particular, the case of John Clope a little bit later. Um, coming back to the, the JSC and uh, its interview processes and um, you know how it comes to uh, proposing uh, candidates for the judiciary. I just wanted to also touch on the case of Jeff Budlender, who is considered one of South Africa's top legal practitioners and who applied numerous times for positions on the bench and uh, was knocked back and rejected again and again. Is that justified? Cecilia, obviously you know what the answer is. It is a disgrace. It always was a disgrace. It's indefensible. I cannot explain on what earthly basis Jeff Budlander was not appointed to the bench. There are others, he's the most glaring one. But Jeff, with his, with his struggle background, with his years in the Legal Resources Center, with the work that he did post 94, uh, his, his the miles that he had walked, the judgment that he showed, the wisdom that he had, the, the mindset that he had. I, he happens to be a friend of mine. I'm not saying this because I'm desperately fond of the man, but because he was preeminently the kind of person who would have graced any bench in the country. Can you imagine how much stronger the Western Cape bench would have been if you had had the wise Jeff Budlander there. There are other wise men there, but he would have strengthened their hand no end. Uh, it's indefensible. The Helen Sussman Foundation established that the Judicial Service Commission is obliged to make public its deliberations. Uh, that was on the face of it, a victory for transparency. I, I, I'm cynical enough to believe that it was merely a warning to those who wanted to caucus, to caucus before they conv convened formally as members of the Judicial Service Commission, and they will still caucus, and they will still have a panel, and they will still do horse trading and I will let your brother-in-law get appointed if you don't object to my cousin. Uh, I'm not saying that those are actual cases, but that kind of discussion. The, the, uh, 
the functioning has been inadequate because of the people on the commission have not been collectively doing their duty. I do believe it's very difficult. I have friends there. I've had friends who served on it. I have a lot of respect for a number of people who have been there over the years. But as an institution, it has failed consistently. I do believe that its methodology is wrong. I don't believe that there is sufficient uh, back, backing given. In, in, it's better nowadays than it used to be. The bar does give and the law society and other institutions do uh, make submissions in respect of particular applicants. But whether there is a, a, a real investigation into the background of an appointee uh, is, is a question that, that I wouldn't like to answer. I do believe that we're, as in so many other respects, far short of what the Americans can do, can go back and get the blood group at birth of a nominee for appointment to the Supreme Court. But uh, the vetting is not good enough. The, it's not firm enough in some respects. We know that Judge Catalia has remarked that when he was asking questions about the competence of people, his colleagues on the Judicial Service Commission looked at him askance. He's not the only person who has said that. He's the only purpose that I know of who said so publicly. A number of the uh, bars appointees have confessed confided as much to me over the years. Uh, but then also you have bandstanding uh, and, and uh, political bandstanding. So the, on the one hand, you have excessive questioning. Uh, and on the other hand, you have uh, kid gloves and, and sweetheart treatment with people who come to, to the, to the Judicial Service Commission, particularly after a couple of days and they're tired and the local judge president backs the particular person and you get uh, people appointed uh, who are not sufficiently interrogated, whose background is not sufficiently interrogated, who should be, be told beforehand. Uh, my friend, we've, we found out that your trust account was uh, in arrears. Uh, when you were an attorney, uh, would you kindly withdraw your name from the Judicial Service Commission's nomination list? That kind of thing. Johan, you've spoken about the fact that the vetting process needs to be revisited uh, and bolstered in a, in a significant way. What else can be done to fix the functioning of the JSC? <laughs> I do believe that the the change of mindset is, is very difficult. I do believe that the, 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 the leadership in the Judicial Service Commission has, a, uh, has an obligation to lead, not to chair, but to lead. I don't believe that it's a breach of anybody's duty to say, we will conduct these proceedings in an orderly, decent, respectful manner. I will not allow that. Right. Now, has anybody done any research? If not, why not? Why, why have we not got sufficient backing from the department or wherever else? Does the department of, of, of the, the, the chief justice need financial resources? Does somebody else, do political parties need it? Uh, there, sh there should be a, a, a more than just criticism from the outside. There should be reform from the inside. It's difficult. It's difficult. We've got this institution. We've been working with it for 25 years and it's getting no better. And, and, and in fact, it's getting worse. And, and, and that is an, should sound an alarm bell. And if you can repeat the, the cliche and have some red lights flashing, it's wrong. It, it, and if it's functioning badly, we must find out why and we must fix it.
So a lot of it comes down to leadership uh, and the way the in the way the proceedings are conducted and the work is discharged. Cecilia, I can I can I can put it perfectly simply. The members of the Judicial Service Commission take an oath of office. Their oath is to the constitution, not to the political party. It's to do what the constitution requires of them. If they are not morally or intellectually fit to do that, they don't belong on the Judicial Service Commission. It's not a sinecure for, 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 for party hacks. It's a very, very responsible job. I would say virtually as responsible as a chairman of a parliamentary committee or even a deputy minister. It is a crucially important job. You know that uh, the, the vetting, for instance, in the United States is done at a provisional level, but it is then done by the full Senate. Uh, for federal appointments. We don't do anything of the kind. Our equivalent of that top level vetting is, is to be in the JSE and they're not doing it. Uh, I, I, I would like to mention, for instance, the case. Uh, oh, you're going to come back to it. Let's go to, to specific cases before the JSE. Yes. Um... Shall we discuss the disciplinary uh, aspect of the JSC, or would you? Is this a case not unrelated to that topic? No, it is exactly that. All right. In, in the case of uh, the complaint against Judge Mortata, nobody had raised the complaint that he had conducted in the magistrate's court. When he was charged with drunken driving, he had conducted a false defense. Now, Isaac Smuts, a member of the Judicial Service Commission, remarked upon this and got in touch with a senior member of the Johannesburg Bar to formulate such a charge. Instead of Judge Mutata being tried on this, probably a much more serious charge than speaking racist language in his cups, being dishonest in court for a judge is, is impeachment matter, finish and clear. Instead of pursuing the complaint against Mutata, Isaac Smuts, the bar's representative on the JSC, was more or less regarded as a pariah for having gone outside the ranks and spoken to counsel and instigated a complaint. I cannot imagine somebody having their sense of values so perverted that instead of saying, Isaac, thank you for doing this, thank you for drawing our attention to an omission in our duty to clear clean the bench of incompetent or improperly acting judges. He is castigated for it. Now, that, that shows such a, a lack of understanding, such a lack of appreciation of what the job is. The job isn't there to close ranks around a colleague. The job is there to close ranks around the Constitution, to clear the judiciary of those who put its image into disrepute to ensure that the administration of justice is manifestly competent, honest, and fair. Uh, now, that's not the Constitution's fault. It's not the Act's fault. It's not the regulation's fault. I'm not even sure that it's the chairperson's fault, but how that kind of mindset can exist in the minds of the judicial members of the JSC uh, goes beyond my comprehension. I just don't understand it. How you can then eventually come to the conclusion that I think 
the man was on the bench for 10 or 11 years, sitting at home drinking coffee, hopefully not red wine, uh, and drawing a full salary. And now for the rest of his life, getting a full salary, instead of dealing with him condignly, appropriately, they find him one year's salary of the umpteen years that he was getting when he was doing nothing and should not have been a judge. The case should have been dealt with within a year, within a, at most two years after the proceedings in the magistrate's court, which incidentally also dragged because the process didn't proceed with sufficient expedition. If the case had been, this is the case of a judge, the judiciary's reputation is at stake. Balega, balega, get on with the job. Deal with it quickly, firmly. Uh, it should not have dragged as it did for years. Uh, okay. And incidentally, the magistrate's court, the magistrate's commission is not in the public eye. Few people ask questions about it. I have no reason to think that things are better there. I have no reason to think that the proceedings are dealt with any more expeditiously there, particularly where senior colleagues uh, of, of known to everybody are accused of something and uh, of something serious and uh, things get dropped, dragged and files get put at the bottom of the pile and, and uh, uh, the item 17 on the agenda, we can't get to it, we'll deal with it in six months when inshallah we meet again. Uh, I, I believe that there's good reason to think that things are not there as it should be and there is clear evidence of corruption on that bench. There isn't in respect of the High Court bench, there's only this doubtful evidence that we've heard before the Zondo Commission the last couple of days, that millions were, were given to corrupt judges, uh, whether it ever got there or not, or whether it actually ever existed, or was just the ruse, we don't know yet. But in the case of the magistrate court, there is actual evidence of money being paid and received, and people being suspended and remaining on suspension for years. Yes, it's a great pity that the magistrates courts and the magistrates commission are not given the kind of attention that they actually deserve. I know that the Helen Sussman Foundation is running a case around the magistrates commission uh, and the way it goes about appointing magistrates. Um, I would now like to turn to the very big case of John Klope, who is the judge president of the Western Cape High Court and has faced serious allegations for, for decades, um, including seeking to influence the Constitutional Court in respect of judgments pertaining to Jacob Zuma. Um, and this last complaint was made in 2008 and to this very day, nothing has happened. You have suggested that uh, there are people, there must be people doing his bidding, but who is it? How is it the case that the JSC has, has allowed for so many years to go by uh, without resolving these, these issues? Cecilia, one cannot imagine how bad the man's record is. It started before him talking to the judges of the Constitutional Court about the judgment they were considering against Mr. Zuma. It starts years before that. It started when he was getting money under the counter from a financial institution that does business in his jurisdiction. He was receiving this money as a private payment, undisclosed, grossly improperly, when he was confronted, he first denied it. Must have been falsely, must have lied in public. He then said it was a travel allowance. It was a sort of an out of pocket. When it transpired that it was close to half a million that he had received, he then said, well, he had permission from 
the uh, late Minister of Justice, who had died before this institution had ever offered him this job. He was found not guilty. He, he was not pursued as to his tax evasion on that issue when one of the judges in the committee tried to pursue that, he was stopped from doing so. Uh, Judge Sloper, having then said he'd made the deal, made his peace with the receiver, which you could only do if you had, if you had failed in the first instance. The man took private money under the counter, he lied about it, he didn't tell the tax man about it, and he remains on the bench, not in a remote country district as a junior judge who's been who's given simple criminal cases to do. He's the president, the leader, the spiritual leader, the ethical norm for the oldest high court division in the country. He then is in disputes with practitioners. He swears at them. He then makes rude and derogatory remarks in the presence of outsiders about his colleagues. He then goes to the Constitutional Court. <laughs> he, he, I witnessed the proceedings when he eventually gave evidence in December last year. In December of 2020, he was finally obliged to submit to questioning about this conduct of his. The tribunal is still to give its reasons. It's, it's nearly two months now. Uh, I don't want to comment any further than, than to say I'm looking forward to the judgment. I'm not sure that I'm not going to be disappointed. Uh, it's disappointing in itself that it takes 12 years to get there. It's unforgivable that it takes 12 years. We now have, while this is hanging over his head, while this should be a caution to him, while this should be a warning to him, we have the Mulawitsi case where he draws the case for himself. It wasn't meant for him. He is the JP, he can control, he can pull the strings. He says, bring me that case, and then dismisses it out of hand. And the appellate division says it's inexplicable how he could have done so. It is explicable, of course, uh, but not honestly. There's the current case, once again, uh, Let's not go there. Let's not go there. But once again, a case of uh, m manipulating a case, a, 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 a hearing, a, a, a judgment date, or a hearing date. We, we, and we have his, not his alleged conduct, his recorded, tape recorded conduct vis a vis his own deputy, whom he denigrated, whom he humiliated whom he virtually hounded out of office. Uh, uh, and then poor Judge Parker, who tells his colleagues he's terribly upset because the JPs assaulted him and knocked him down. And what must they do about it? And they say, put it on affidavit. And a year later, the JP says, that's a lie. So he says, sorry, I made a mistake. I misunderstood misinterpreted it. There was a misunderstanding. The man is not fit to be on the bench. I said so 20 years ago. I repeat it again. He has not tried to sue me. He would not dare to try to sue me. The man's name is proverbial. We know that. He's proverbial not for what he has done, but for what he has not been dealt with. 
well, what he has not been punished for. It's a reflection on the Judicial Service Commission. It is a reflection more seriously and directly a reflection on the integrity of the South African bench. The bench, which I said at the outset, is the bastion. It is the one leg of state that has stood relatively firm in, 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 the, in, the, in the last two, two and a half decades. And it is, has its underpinning eroded by this kind of conduct or uh, uh, lack of conduct. Uh, and this, th I, have, I have tried, and I don't want to sound my own trumpet, but it's, it's part of the record. I have tried time and time again, publicly and confidentially, privately, to expedite the matter in the interests of all of us. And I have at best had a stone warning. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you know, Cecilia, what people don't talk about is that John Schlopper accused the judges of the Constitutional Court, the Chief Justice my bosom saintly friend, Pius Langer, of plotting against him, of lying in order to undermine him. He says this publicly. He has to this day not acknowledged that it was a mistake, let alone apologized. And nobody has charged him with that. I believe that that is conduct of a nature which in itself disqualifies him from sitting in judgment on anybody else ever again. A man who can say that kind of thing without a tittle of justification about the chief justice, his deputy and the other judges does not deserve to be a judge. Uh, yes, it's not being dealt with. The fact that he, according to the de his deputy, tried to manipulate the identity of the judges in a politically sensitive case is in itself an extremely serious charge. That's not being leveled against him. You know, our system, no two judges are the same. Uh, they can't be and they shouldn't be. They're all individuals, they all have their own talents, weaknesses, strengths, backgrounds, political views, hang-ups. But one thing you know is that you get the luck of the draw. Nobody's going to pick a horse for your course. You are going to have uh, the, the luck of the draw. You may get a, a, a judge that leans this way, you may get a judge that leans that way. Uh, it's happenstance. One, no practitioner doesn't know that. Once you've got a JP or somebody else who manipulates the identity of the judges to deal with certain cases, the whole system of fairness, of evil, equal chance falls away. It perverts the whole system. That is not being laid at his doorstep, and I cannot understand why not. I'm afraid that you cannot say to a member of the Judicial Service Commission, why don't you charge him with this? Because maybe that member will be told you're interfering with the interests of justice. You're behaving as disgracefully as Isaac Smuts did. How dare you do this? And you end up being the victim, the target, instead of the complainant. Uh, it's there. The, the, the man has and continues to commit offenses unbefitting him for judicial office. But there it is. He'll stay until heaven knows when. Incidentally, the issue in, in December, the trial in December last year, uh, didn't delay or in any way frustrate the other issues being determined. Uh, the whole deputy complaint against him, the whole 
Parker fiasco. None of that has been delayed by, by the, the, the old constitutional court complaint. And yet, how long is it now? When did this first hit the, the, the headlines? Uh, it's, it's, it's more than a year. Johan, there's another issue of discipline around the Judicial Service Commission, and that is that it ought to be producing annual reports and submitting these to Parliament. What is going on? It's legislatively obligated to, to do this, and it seemingly hasn't. And uh, in these reports, we should be hearing about all the cases that the Commission is dealing with and uh, the, the progress on them. We have no information. No, uh, I, I can but confirm what you say. Uh, I, I cannot comment on it. It, it, it is so. Johan, I would also like to uh, talk about the issue of judicial performance. Um, we may have an anecdotal sense of how the courts are functioning by looking at major cases, landmark cases, um, but do we really know what is going on in a more in-depth and a more systematic sense. Um, in, in 2018, the judiciary released its first judiciary annual report. And according to a press release that accompanied this, uh, the judiciary said that this was a historical event as it was the first time the judiciary um, as an arm of state, and I quote, took the lead in accounting for its work and for the power and authority the state has endowed to it. But at a close look, the reports appear to be really perfunctory uh, and rather meaningless. Um, I mean, essentially, there's only one quantitative metric uh, by which court performance is measured, and this is the total number of cases finalized by each of the superior courts within, a, within the period covered by the report. But there's so much confusion as to what finalized means that it, it in, in the end just doesn't mean anything really. What should the courts be measuring and, and uh, that deserves more attention? Cecilia, let's, let's, not, let's not create the impression, the false impression that we are just criticizing. Uh, I do believe do believe it should be said and should be said publicly that the Chief Justice should be commended for introducing this practice. It has never been the practice in the past and it is good and right that there be a report. However, you are right that for the report really to be meaningful, it must contain a good deal more than it does contain. I don't believe that the Chief Justice is being uh, disingenuous in reporting in that way. I don't think he has the data to provide the detailed reporting, functional, significant reporting that you have in mind. I, I happen to be intimately involved with an international organization that does justice audits. We've done audits in a couple of countries and I know what a justice audit looks like. We have nothing of the kind here. We don't have that in-depth investigation, gathering of data at the police station level, at the prison level, at the court level, at the appeal court level. Uh, we don't have that. So what the Chief Justice is doing is, is, is good. It could be a great deal better. And we would hope that it would be a great deal better. The, you're quite right merely to say uh, how many cases have been finalized and whatever finalized means uh, is, is not only meaningless in that it could be downright misleading. And any prosecutor, any control prosecutor knows how to manipulate his, his weekly or monthly report as to cases that have been tried, cases that have been finished. Uh, any police sergeant knows how to up his number of arrests. Uh, you, you can manipulate the data unless you are checked and audited over time. Uh, real meaningful statistics in the administration of justice, particularly the criminal justice system, is a very, very tricky job. 
uh, I don't blame the CJ for, for not giving us uh, the, the chapter and verse. I do believe that it's, it, it would be to everybody's advantage that we found out how many hours magistrates actually do sit on the bench, not how many hours they book, but how many hours are actually spent, how many hours are actually wasted in travel, how many hours are actually wasted because the case flow management is non-existent and uh, witnesses aren't warned and, and the prisoners aren't brought to court and lawyers aren't advised that the case is on the roll. Uh, you know, all of the umpteen I's that have been dotted and T's that have got to be crossed for the system to work. Uh, it, it's a complex, it's a complex mechanism. And to measure whether it's working properly, you need thermometers and measuring instruments at various levels on various activities. Uh, and what we've got is not good enough. Absolutely. I, I guess it, I, I just uh, go back to the saying, if it matters, measure it. Um, and of course, the magistracy is often, um, you know, given that the magistrates' courts are courts of first instance, uh, this is often the one and only experience of the justice system many South Africans will have. So it would really be interesting to know how ordinary South Africans are experiencing the justice system, whether it is anything like, you know, the, the landmark cases around human rights uh, and uh, separation of powers and, and holding to account the executive and all that sort of thing. That would be rather interesting to know. Cecilia, I, I wrote a textbook on criminal procedure. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a criminal procedure fanatic. I believe that the freedom, the liberty, the integrity of the individual vests in the criminal justice system, not in the constitution. It's in the nitty gritty of the daily existence that you, people, the vast majority of people enjoy life or find it a misery. The, the, Never mind the broad strokes and the principles. It's what happens down in the magistrate's court that, that really counts. Whether the prosecutor is ready, whether the policeman has done his job, whether the detective supervisor has seen to it that he's maintained the case the diary properly, that the docket is in a fit state to be presented to the prosecutor, that the prosecutor gets it in time and actually works on it before he goes to court. For the magistrate to come into court at nine o'clock, to adjourn at 11 o'clock, resume at 11.15, sit till one o'clock, resume at two o'clock and sit until four o'clock. That doesn't happen. That's what should happen. And that would only happen if we do every step of the way, being audited and properly checked. Uh, and of course, in the, in, in the, in the, in the High Court, uh, we have the additional difficulty, problem, uh, little ripple that judges, Admittedly, there's a code of conduct. There's a code of conduct for judges. But judges are not bound only by the code of conduct. There's a, since time immemorial and universally, there are ethical norms that apply to judges. Norms, standards, cultural practices that I, I do not see being honored when you have people like John Schlope let loose without any reproof from anybody. Uh, when fellow judges, fellow judges president sit on the bench with him in the Judicial Service Commission, when we as freedom under law object we are told you're interfering with business that's got nothing to do with you. How can this man sit in judgment on the selection of judges? Is he an arbiter? Now, the, the norms, the things, 
that I, I think the Germans have a, a word for the fingertip feeling. Uh, the, 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 that is just wrong. Uh, and I think all of us, all of us, whatever your culture in South Africa, know that there are things that your mother said, we, we don't behave like that. That's just not right. And we know there are things that are being done, done by judges that are just not right. At the moment, uh, with, with the distance to, to judgments, with the, the COVID-imposed uh, electronic uh, hearing of cases, the temptation for judicial officers to cut corners is all the greater. The need for vigilance, self-vigilance, collegial vigilance, Vigilance by the judicial, the, by the 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 uh, justice family as a whole, legal practitioners, advocates, attorneys, litigants. Uh, the, the need for 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 vigilance is all the greater now. We know that access to the courts has been materially limited by the 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 limitations under. The, the, the uh, COVID restrictions. Courts work in public. Judges deliver their judgments in public. Witnesses give evidence and are tested in public. Prosecutors prosecute, make their allegations and make their summations in public. That is the best defense mechanism, the best quality control mechanism, that these things happen in the broad daylight. And it is our job and it's society's job to watch, to see that things are being done as they should be done. In this current set setup, where access to courts is severely limited and where the determination of cases uh, otherwise than in, in clear light of day and in public view is, is, is dangerous. It's in principle undesirable. The sooner we can put an end to it, the better, but the more vigilant we must be in the meantime. The, 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 the danger is always there. And I'm not speaking as a as a, as a, a sour old man. I was there. I behaved myself when I did behave myself because I knew people would see when I didn't behave myself. I would be subject to criticism. I would be subject to gossip. The bar would talk about it. The legal profession, my colleagues. Uh, you, you kept on the straight and narrow because you're being watched. And if we're not being watched, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Judicial officers uh, are human beings. Indeed, and I'd like to talk about one particular judicial officer now, um, namely the Chief Justice. So the current Chief Justice um, will be stepping down later on this year. And so one expects Quite a bit of public debate about what we should expect from a chief justice as the leader of the judiciary and i wanted to start by asking you why the role of the chief justice is so important cecilia it speaks for itself both in terms of tradition and in terms of the our, our law the constitution and and the the, the, the legislation and under the constitution the Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary. He sets the norm. He is the the, the set the the titular and the and the actual head of the judiciary. Uh, he sets the standards, the regulations, the uh, code of conduct. These are issued in his name, and are subject to his supervision. It is a position of great moral authority. 
uh, it is a position of great moral responsibility. It is a position of legal authority. Uh, when the Chief Justice sits in court, he sits as a as the first un, among equals, but in his administrative capacity, he is a super judge. He, he, he does have a, a very special role to play in his interaction with the executive, in his interaction with the legislature. The chief justice is the judiciary, is the personification of the judiciary in its public image and in its interaction with the, the other branches of state. And within the judiciary, he is the moral and ethical head and administrative boss of all of the judges. That does not mean that he has any say in the determination of any case, but nor that he will want to interfere in the administration of any particular division's administration he is ultimately responsible, but the, and the, but the the actual authority then vests in the heads of of the individual courts, who could in 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 a collective interact with the chief justice. But he's the he's the moral head, ethical head. And so, what kind of qualities would we be looking for in a chief justice? And what does good leadership mean? Uh, I really can't answer that. Uh, you know what, it depends so much on individuals. I think of the chief justices that I have known over the years since I started, differ chalk and cheese from one another. Uh, Mokhweng has what it takes. In my book, he has the qualities required of a Chief Justice, whether he always exercises them is a matter of personal opinion. He and I have differed on that. Uh, privately, I don't mind differing from him publicly on it, but that he has the moral suasion and the, the, the uh, moral authority to, to speak as the Chief Justice within the judiciary and representing the judiciary to the world outside is, is, is undoubted. He grew into it. He came to it as a relatively inexperienced judicial officer. I think he has surprised friend and foe in the way he has grown into the office. Uh, I have not served with him, so how he is as a colleague on the bench, I could not say, but that he has uh, manifested the qualities to the outside world, yes. That I agree with everything he's done, certainly no. I do not believe that he's, he is right in being public about his own particular faith. I think that's a private matter that does not, should not be a matter of public debate. Uh, it's, it's embarrassing to, to others who are of the same faith and others who are not of the same faith. Uh, but, uh, uh, right, uh, I, I don't think he should have manifested the attitude that he did when he had the press conference that was challenging what he had done in praying at the hospital. Uh, but that's him, it's not me. It's his personality. I think he was a little bit too confrontational, but that's a matter of opinion. I don't think it was wrong. I wouldn't think that another person would necessarily have done it the same way. Uh, he's done a good job. He's run a tight court. Uh, I don't think he's filled vacancies as often and as quickly as he should have, uh, but I don't think that is only the CJ's job. That is, uh, not necessarily all to be laid at his door. Uh, I think he, he can face retirement in the knowledge that he's done an honorable, good job. I'd just like to go back to um, the Chief Justice's 
more recent comments, um, namely the ones around COVID-19 vaccination. So what he said um, was, and I quote, I lock out any vaccine that is not of you. If there may be any vaccine that is of the devil, meant to infuse 666 in the lives of people, meant to corrupt their DNA, any such vaccine, Lord God Almighty, may it be destroyed by, the, by fire in the name of Jesus. Um, yeah, should members of the judiciary be speaking out like no. this? You know perfectly well that, that he spoke out of turn. He, he, what he said was unwise. It should not have been said. But uh, to, why crucify him for it? It was silly. Should not have been done. Uh, it is upsetting that he did do so, but let's move on. I don't think his strange religious perceptions and this comment of his on on vaccines was was through the through the spectacles of a of a. a, 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 a a practitioner of his faith, uh, it's not as a judge. I don't think we can. I don't think there's any reason to think that Judge Chief Justice Mukwen will, in the exercise of his judicial functions, uh, manifest the kind of uh, lack of good judgment that he did in this particular instance. I'm not going to criticize him for it more than say just that. Fair enough. Um, now, just to look at the future, um, if there were three things that you would advise to improve the judiciary, what would those three things be? You know, what I can say is what I tried to maintain myself that the court is not your court, the people's court. You are a servant in that court. You may preside, but you are merely there on behalf of the people and representing the people. Uh, you have no power save through the constitution and given by the people. To be a judge is to be a judge, not to be God. There are decided limits to your powers. Be modest rather than radical in, you, in your approach to things. Uh, and always remember that it's not about you, it's about the law, it's about the case. Uh, you're merely an important cipher in the in the in the exercise, but but no more than that. You know, to say do your work, never go to court unprepared. Be polite to counsel, listen to people. Uh, be polite. Try to see things through the other person's spectacles. These are these are platitudes that that that. Uh, that one cannot address to the judiciary as a whole. Uh, I, uh, I suppose there's one thing I should add, that if you've done your job, if you've done your job, if you're satisfied that you have done your job, honestly, sincerely, to the best of your ability, let the heavens fall. Let the politicians criticize as much as they like. Let the media castigate as much as they like. But listen to what they say, because maybe you didn't do the right thing. And maybe you must repair it next time around. Uh, but that's just a question of modesty that goes with a sense of your own fallibility. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not good. I, I can't be any wiser or any more prescriptive than, than ju just that. Don't be prescriptive. Thank you so very much, Johan, for spending almost two hours with me uh, to discuss the judiciary. Uh, it has been an absolute privilege. And uh, 
I'm sure our listeners and our viewers will in, enjoy what you've had to, what you've so generously shared with us. So thank you so very much. You're very welcome. 